We've seen some new developments that are very exciting in the treatment of patients with an EGFR mutation over the last year or so. What this specifically means is that there are now third generation EGFR inhibitors, the leading ones known as uh, osimertinib or AZD9291 and rosuletinib from Clovis, CO1686. And these agents are expected to be approved by the FDA very soon, but specifically as a treatment for patients who have developed what's called acquired resistance after prior therapy with a different EGFR inhibitor, an agent like gefitinib, also known as Iressa, uh, erlotinib, also known as Tarceva, or uh, afatinib, also known as Gilatrif or Geotrif, depending on where in the world you live. Now, those other agents are the more typical first-line therapies, but unfortunately, patients demonstrate progression of their cancer eventually over time, whether that is a few months into therapy or a few years into it. So these other therapies, known as osimertinib and rosuletinib, and others are being developed as well, but earlier in, in trials, uh, are clearly active in patients who have uh, a T790M mutation, a specific mutation associated with progression that is seen in about 50 or 60 percent of patients when their cancer progresses. The question now is whether these agents that are active as second-line therapy are especially active when given in the first-line setting. And so there are trials that are specifically comparing these newer agents to the older agents but given as a first-line treatment. One of them is known as Flora, or uh, first-line Aura. Aura is the name of the series of studies that look at uh, the AZD drug osimertinib uh, in various settings. And this first-line study directly compares uh, osimertinib to either Iressa or Tarceva, given as a first-line therapy, to patients who have an EGFR mutation, an activating EGFR mutation. There's a very similar study known as TIGER-1 that is giving rosuletinib, the Clovis drug, or uh, standard Tarceva to patients. So these are both randomized trials, and they're both looking for a significant improvement, a prolongation in what is called the progression-free survival, the time before the cancer progresses on the first-line treatment. Now, it's important, though, to clarify that seeing a difference in the time to progression may not be the most important factor. At the end of the day, we want our patients to live as long as possible, and I think of this as a distance race with many laps. And so it is not necessarily best to just get the fastest time in the first lap. We want people to uh, be able to have something left in the tank for later on in the race. And one of the concerns that I and many other experts have about giving these very good therapies up front is that if you exhaust their benefit as the first therapy, you won't have anything else necessarily to give as a second therapy, at least that targets EGFR. You would have chemotherapy and you can try uh, immunotherapy, but you might get more benefit by giving the uh, first-line therapies we already use that are perhaps a little less effective overall, but then have a very good ace in the hole to give after that, versus giving your, your best therapy up front maybe getting two or three months longer as a first-line therapy, or even six months longer. But if you'd end up doing better by giving uh, a less effective first-line therapy and then a more effective second-line therapy, that total time could be more than the overall benefit of just getting a good first-line therapy and then having no other EGFR therapy to turn to. We're going to learn more about these studies, and you can find out about them from the links uh, that are going to be shown here. So I would encourage you, if you are just diagnosed with an EGFR mutation positive lung cancer, to look into one of these trials. We don't know the answer to the question of which is better, which is why we're asking the question. We will know more soon.